instead of being just a Muslim holy shrine like it was for the past 1400 years, to have Jewish uh, presence on the, this uh, holy site for Muslims. Uh, my family is not Muslim, but I think this is an atrocity. <laughs> President Obama, for politically expedient reasons, 15 months ago, wanted this problem, as he saw it, of these immigrant children coming to the United States alone, this surge, to go away. And so he outsourced his problem to Mexico. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown on over 30 cable stations from Vermont to New York City, on the internet at thestruggle.org our YouTube channel, Struggle Video Media. It's not enough for Israel to get over $3 billion a year in our tax money for its military. The Israeli politicians expect Americans to also pay for the social needs of their soldiers. They set up a tax-exempt group called Friends of the Israeli Defense Forces, and they have lavish events where rich people can hobnob and get a macho thrill from meeting up with Israeli military officers who talk about their wars against the natives. In San Francisco, there was a picket of one such event. End the occupation now! End the occupation now! End the occupation now! My name is Richard Chan. I'm a law student, a librarian. We're here protesting the uh, Friends of the IDF. We're here doing a fundraiser for the uh, heroes um, of the IDF, uh, who they've put up on big banners, you know, um, looking very heroic with their guns and all that kind of thing. But, you know, soldiers pointing guns at civilians, and like, you know, there's the video going around the internet. And, you know, a woman who's lying on the ground and soldiers just like taking shot at her, uh, you know, and this, as you can see, very wealthy supporters of the IDF like think that this is completely okay. So, you know, we're saying it's a crime of genocide, which it is. IDF is holding a gala for the murderers of Palestinians and trying to get away with it without anybody doing a thing. I, I just couldn't couldn't be a part of that. Here to protest the IDF. It's a vicious uh, criminal enterprise for going on for more than half a century now. Um, ruthless. Uh, bunch of killers. You may recall that in Connecticut in May, two young Jewish men tried to speak up in a synagogue in Westport that was hosting a Friends of the IDF fundraiser. Though they held nothing more than cell phones in the synagogue, a staffer there called police and claimed she thought there was a gun, creating panic. A SWAT-type police response and school lockdowns. They were arrested on a slew of charges that could have gotten them a year in jail. The legal process dragged on until just recently. One of the two received accelerated rehabilitation for his free speech crime. The other, Greg Williams, was convicted of a minor offense and had to pay a fine. Here's part of what he said on Facebook. Shocker of shockers, my case ended today with a B misdemeanor finding and no probation. After friends of the IDF tried to get me thrown out of school this spring, I'm going to go ahead and say that, like their failure in that attempt, this outcome was the result of sustained organizing and community support, including Jews for the Palestinian Right of Return's consistent demand that the state's attorney drop the charges against me and Dan, a demand supported by over a thousand petitioners, as well as positive coverage by Electronic Intifada, the Hampton Institute, the New Haven Register, Socialist Worker, and Truthout. 
Now, the school that Williams referred to was Yale Divinity School. Williams was graduating, and the IDF friends tried to deny him his degree, but they failed. It's high time for Americans to unfriend the friends of the IDF. Now, one incident at the end of a Palestinian's life on the West Bank. A 50-year-old Palestinian peace activist, a medical doctor named Hazem Aza, died apparently of a heart condition. He might have been saved, but for a fact of life in Hebron. The IDF does not allow Palestinian ambulances into the part of Hebron that is slowly being seized by Israeli Jews. So Aza had to walk 700 meters, the equivalent of seven football fields, until he could get to the ambulance. He died shortly thereafter. The website Mufta wrote about him, Hashem would regularly give tours of the old city to internationals, educating them about the Israeli occupation generally and his city more specifically. He was bold and would not shy away from standing a few feet from an armed IDF soldier and recounting for tour participants the uh, Israeli government's litany of violations and crimes against Palestinians. Here is one minute of Hashem Aza speaking about what Israelis did to his family. So uh, they catch my nephew in this place exactly when he was nine years old. They put a stone in his mouth and they smashed his teeth with the stones they destroyed all of his teeth. The third thing which they done it against us, they saw that my wife was pregnant with three months, they came and detected her and she lost her pregnancy. The second time my wife was pregnant with four months, they came and detected her and she lost the second pregnancy. Later on they came and attacked us inside our houses and they destroyed all of the furniture, everything inside the house destroyed. And they, with the back of the guns they beat me here and destroyed my teeth both sides and they beat me also here and all of us in that time got injury. It was curfew, no one could move from his house. Now to give a bigger picture of what's going on, an interview I did with Dr. Mazen Kumsia, former vice chair of our parent group, the Middle East Crisis Committee. He teaches at Bethlehem University on the West Bank. I'm interviewing Dr. Mazen Kumsia from Palestine, from the West Bank. We're going to talk about the latest developments. So this month of October, it seems to have started in Al-Aqsa. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so the Israeli government, taking advantage of the fact that there's a lot of mayhem in countries like Syria and Iraq and Yemen, and the focus of the media on those issues, tried to implement its long strategic plan of taking over Al-Aqsa and dividing it uh, in terms of time and in terms of location, so that uh, instead of being just a Muslim holy shrine like it was for the past 1400 years, to have Jewish uh, presence on the, this uh, holy site for Muslims. Uh, my family is not Muslim, but I think this is an atrocity that uh, that uh, this uh, ho third holiest shrine in Islam is being attacked by extremist settlers living illegally in the West Bank, by the way. And international law clearly rejects Israeli sovereignty in East Jerusalem in Al-Aqsa Mosque and rejects those uh, measures to take parts of Al-Aqsa and make it into some sort of Jewish synagogue, whether uh, in terms of time or place. There is a precedent for this because Israel did the same thing with the Ibrahimi Mosque in, uh, in Hebron. Uh, so that's why the Muslim world is taking it seriously and the Palestinians, Christians and Muslims have taken it seriously. I mean we saw videos of uh, tear gas in the mosque and uh, sound grenades. I mean what happened there? Yes, so basically Israel has started to turn the whole place uh, as a, a military uh, target zone and, and is attacking it almost on a daily basis. 
attacking the Muslims going in there. And that's in addition, of course, to refusing to allow Muslim prayers for many Muslims, for a majority of Muslims actually who wish to pray there, a majority of Palestinian Muslims in the West Bank, and Palestinian Christians like me are not allowed to Jerusalem. And, and those who are in Jerusalem or Palestinians inside the Green Line, uh, they are allowed to pray in the mosque only if they are above a certain age, like 50 years old for men and so forth. So these religious uh, freedoms have been infringed upon and, uh, and this has been accelerating. That's why there was uh, some resistance to it. And this resistance, uh, Israel put it down brutally so that so far in this month of October, about the middle of the month of October, we had over 40 Palestinians who were killed. Nine of them were children and also five Israelis, I think, were also killed. So it is uh, an amazing uh, escalation of violence because of Israel's plans for the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And we also have violence going on against Palestinians constantly on a daily basis. That shocking arson of the Dawabsha family, three people burned to death and no one arrested, all these things. Uh, yes, and I personally lost many friends in this uh, struggle, in nonviolent resistance even, or Palestinians who were not even engaged in resistance were shot simply for being Palestinians. There is a number of videotapes actually showing Israelis after they shot these Palestinians, whether Israeli settlers or soldiers, that Israeli soldiers planted knives next to these uh, young people. You, oh, oh, essentially all the victims were under 25 years of age and they planted knives to show that they were uh, knife-wielding Palestinians attacking them. But there's video proof that this was planted evidence in many of those cases and this is uh, shows the level of racism. Even uh, Israelis shot other Israelis simply because they looked Arab uh, and, and so forth. In one case, a guy with uh, a Jewish Israeli who happened to have uh, Arab, uh, like Yemeni background uh, as a Jew, but uh, he was shot. And then an Eritrean or Ethiopian man just yesterday in uh, uh, Beersheba was not only killed, but they even tortured him after he was killed. And he had nothing to do with anything. He was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. And he happened to look like an Arab, basically. I wanted to close by uh, talking, uh, you mentioned you were not Muslim, you know, sometimes the narrative is these radical Muslims against the Jews. Uh, talk about the city of, Beit, uh, of Bethlehem and, and the town where you're from and the, the non-Muslim Palestinians. So Bethlehem is a suburb of Jerusalem, essentially. It's less than four miles away from the center of Jerusalem, the center of Bethlehem. And uh, Bethlehem as a suburb of Jerusalem was isolated from Jerusalem by an Israeli apartheid wall that prevents most Palestinians from Bethlehem from arriving to Jerusalem. I was a high school teacher in Jerusalem and now I'm not allowed to go to Jerusalem. Even with my American passport, I'm not allowed to go to Jerusalem. You're an American citizen. Yes. So it's, it's an amazing feature of uh, apartheid system that segregates based on religion and forbids people who are indigenous to the land from uh, freely moving around. Whereas any uh, Jew and any convert to Judaism from around the world is welcome to come get automatic citizenship and live on stolen Palestinian land and move freely. Uh, hence I say this is a structure that structured apartheid or racism and, uh, and that's why we resist and that's why we support the boycott divestment sanctions movement. And Bethlehem, which in this uh, end of year becomes very prominent for religious reasons, the current Bethlehem is getting walled in. Uh, yes, and uh, the wall is being built around Bethlehem, but also even the wall is being built in neighborhoods within Jerusalem, like al Isawiya, which Israel started to build a wall around the neighborhood because it's an Arab neighborhood. Um, uh, just uh, this week they started building the wall inside Jerusalem. Uh, this is, shows again the hypocrisy and the stupidity of the notion that uh, Jerusalem is a unified capital of Israel, that Israel annexed it. Jerusalem, since its occupation, illegal occupation, I may add, by international law, 
uh, remains illegally occupied and remains segregated city and remains uh, a city that oppression happens on a daily basis. Denial of residency rights. Over 9,000 Palestinians lost their residency rights in Jerusalem just in the last few years, basically ethnically cleansed out of Jerusalem. And Bethlehem is suffering because Bethlehem's economy is dependent on Jerusalem and has been isolated from Jerusalem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Prime Minister Netanyahu claims that Israel's not trying to change the status of Al-Aqsa, yet his own government subsidizes groups like the Temple Institute, which is working actively to build a temple in the Al-Aqsa complex. Or consider what happened in 1994 at the tomb of the patriarchs in Hebron after a terrible massacre there of 29 Palestinians being murdered, the Palestinians had to pay a further price. The tomb was divided into Muslim and Jewish sections, segregated, and has remained so till this day. I'm not often shocked these days, but a report on Democracy Now! did that to me. A Pulitzer Prize winning reporter is claiming that the Obama administration is giving tens of millions of dollars to the brutal Mexican government in an effort to keep migrants and refugees away from the U.S. border, even though it knows this means a death sentence for many of these people. Be forewarned, many of the details on this report are gruesome. We turn now to a startling new report that examines America's broken immigration system called The Refugees at Our Door, just published in The New York Times by Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Sonia Nazario. The article suggests the Obama administration is paying the Mexican government to keep people from reaching the U.S. border, people who often have legitimate asylum claims and, once deterred in their journey, often left to die. Nazario writes, quote, in the past 15 months, at the request of President Obama, Mexico has carried out a ferocious crackdown on refugees fleeing violence in Central America. The United States has given Mexico tens of millions of dollars for the fiscal year that ended September 30th to stop these migrants from reaching the United States border to claim asylum. Essentially, the United States has outsourced a refugee problem to Mexico that is similar to the refugee crisis now roiling Europe. Well, for more, we go to Los Angeles, where we're joined by Sonia Nazario. She is the author of Enrique's Journey, the story of a boy's dangerous odyssey to reunite with his mother. Sonia Nazario, welcome back to Democracy Now! Explain what you found. How is the U.S. paying Mexico to stop migrants from coming north? Well, we're doing the exact opposite of what Germany is doing. And, you know, I should say that um, uh, I think we can have a, a uh, debate about what should be done about economic migrants, people who come here for a better life. Uh, but with refugees, that is someone who is being persecuted and they are fleeing for their lives. And in Germany, we've seen these emotional images of the German people and Angela Merkel uh, opening their doors, welcoming them at train stations. And what we are doing as a country is we have paid uh, Mexico tens of millions of dollars to stop these refugees from arriving at our border and claiming, asking for refuge, asking for asylum. Our State Department is funding this, and our congressional leaders, uh, the Department of State has said in a recent document that they want to spend $90 million next fiscal year, in 2016, to do more of this. This. And what we're seeing is that this is paying for this incredible crackdown where the immigration authorities uh, have uh, increased immensely the number of deportees. Mexico, uh, in the first seven months, deported 23,000 more Central Americans than the United States, and it plans to up that amount by 70 percent this year, while the rate is cut by the United States. So we're asking Mexico, basically, to do our dirty work. President Obama, for politically expedient reasons, 15 months ago, wanted this problem, as he saw it, of these immigrant children coming to the United States alone, this surge, to go away. And so he outsourced his problem to Mexico. Can you tell us the story of uh, Julie Elizabeth Perez, who you met in a migrant shelter in Mexico? Yes, last month I spent uh, seven or eight days in Mexico. I felt that not enough attention was being focused on this. 
And Julie, first, uh, you know, she lives in one of the most deadly towns in Honduras, which uh, the homicide rate has recently declined some, but per the last U UN report, worldwide had the highest homicide rate in the world after uh, Syria. Uh, and she lived in this very deadly town, controlled largely by the 18th Street Gang, a gang that, by the way, started here in Los Angeles, where I live. And uh, she first, her brother was abducted and he was uh, killed. Uh, they stole his $91 in rent money that he was ta taking to pay. They cut off his feet and his, and, his, um, and his hands when they killed him. And then they abducted her 14-year-old son. They had asked him to join the gang. Uh, they start doing this to children at very young ages, 9, 10, 12 years old. He was 14. He had gone on a short errand a few steps away with a friend, been kidnapped, and she frantically searched for him and found him a few hours later. He had been and suffocated to death with a bag over his head and found in a garbage bag. She fled to another city three hours away, and seven months later, you know, the gangs are incredibly good at intelligence. They beat the CIA by a mile in figuring out who's coming in and out of towns and where uh, the movement of people who are escaping gang violence. And she got a warning, we know where you are now. So seven months later, she fled uh, to Mexico, trying to reach her mother, grandmother, who were legally in the United States. She applied to the U.S. Embassy for a visa. They turned her down. And so her only choice to save her three remaining children was to try to get through Mexico to the United States. And it took her 20 days to travel 250 miles. These migrants are walking through Mexico now because they cannot get on the trains uh, on the on top, right on top of freight trains as they used to do because of this uh, crackdown. And she encountered all sorts of obstacles, M immigration officials shooting at her on top of the train with her children aboard, uh, having to go around these enormous number of checkpoints, raids now, 20,000 raids on immigrants just in the past year. As Yes, it's absolutely true. We are bankrolling this. Uh, tens of millions of dollars last year, and as I said, $90 million proposed by the Department of State this year, and that doesn't count what the Department of Defense has been uh, kicking in, an unknown amount. And uh, many, many uh, studies have shown that uh, Mexican officials, both the federal police, the state police, and immigration officials are complicit in uh, the uh, this um, this uh, robbery, rape, uh, killing of immigrants as they try to travel north to the United States to safety. And we see children now walking the length of Mexico, trying to elude those officials, and women like Julie uh, putting their children, her three-year-old, her six-year-old, uh, her six-year-old walking for, for days on end, uh, for hour, 12 hours at a time, putting her three-year-old on her shoulders, trying to get her north through Mexico to the United States to safety. I, I think what we are doing is shameful. Um, refugees are people fleeing harm, and we should at least give them a chance of uh, proving that they are refugees. And if they aren't, then perhaps send them back. But um, we have signed protocols saying that we will protect refugees. We have urged other countries like Germany uh, and the countries surrounding Syria who have taken in more than four million refugees. We get a few tens of thousands, and instead of trying to uh, comprehend what they're going through and welcome them or at least put them through our judicial system and see if they qualify or not, we have paid Mexico to send them back to their deaths. There is a, uh, a study by our social researcher that just came out showing that in the last 21 months, 90 people at least have been murdered shortly after being returned by the United States and Mexico uh, to their home countries in these three very violent countries in Central America, including a 14-year-old boy returned to Honduras, Gredis. Uh, within 24 hours of being returned home, he had two bullets in his head. This is what our policies are causing, and I think the American people need to say this must stop. I do not want this done in my name. I do not want my taxpayer money funding this. And I have a letter on my website, EnriquesJourney.com, if you agree to send your congressional leader saying that you want a fairer policy towards refugee children in particular. Um, you yourself rode on top of seven freight trains um, the length of Mexico with child migrants a decade ago. How does what they go through today compare, Senor Nazario? 
Well, I think, you know, it was certainly difficult back then. I still have post-traumatic stress to uh, indicate how hard it was. And as uh, Luis mentioned, it was very difficult. Many people are uh, robbed, raped, beaten back then. But we've seen just in the last year an 81 percent increase in robberies. And you're seeing by the time people got to the shelter, the migrant shelter, which really has become a refugee camp, by the way, uh, a few, just two, three hundred miles inside the southern border. Border of Mexico, 95 percent now are robbed by the time they get there, some of them multiple times. Uh, the majority of the women are being raped. And so what you're seeing is an exponential increase in uh, the harm being done to these migrants, both by the immigration authorities and by this whole um, army of delinquents that have taken the message from the Mexican authorities. It's open season on migrants. You can do whatever you want, because we need to get uh, at the U.S. Uh, uh, you know, bidding, we need to get this flow to stop, to get these people not to reach the United States border. And so what we're seeing is instead of uh, riding on top of that train, um, on top of the freight trains up the length of Mexico, as I did uh, for my book Enrique's Journey, uh, people are uh, going in places that are harder, that they are more isolated. And that's where these delinquents have all risen up that are uh, robbing and raping uh, and and killing in in extraordinary numbers, twenty thousand Central Americans are being disappeared every single year, kidnapped, and many of these people resurface after someone in the United States has to pay ransom to uh, release them. But if you can't pay, they will kill you. They will cut you up in front of the others as a message. Many of them are being enslaved to work in marijuana fields or digging tunnels, prostituted. They are finding people. Um, Fourteen migrants recently awoke, drugged up with slits on the side of their bodies, wounds that had been sewn up. Their kidneys had been harvested. Uh, it's, it's another level and, and a higher number of robberies, rapes, killings that are happening today than when uh, Luis made the journey and when I made the journey. And yeah, you... And recall that these people might not be running away from their home countries in the first place if it were not for the U.S. practice of supporting South American dictators and reactionaries. See the whole October 14th piece on Democracy Now!'s YouTube page. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller, and this is The Struggle.